All right. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar from pipelines to supply chains, level up with supply chain choreography. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm gonna read our code of conduct and then I'll hand over to David Espejo, cartographer, community manager at VMware and Cora Iberclyde, developer advocate at VMware. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee, but there is a Q&A box on the left hand, right hand side of your screen. Please feel free to put your questions there and we will get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct and please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They will also be available via your registration link and the recording will be available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I'll hand it over to David and Cora to kick off today's presentation. All right, thank you, Libby. And thanks to the CNCF for giving us the chance of being here. All right, welcome everyone. Um, in this session, alongside with Cora Iverclay, developer advocate at VMware, we will discuss or um, describe some of the current challenges we see in the, um, in the whole problem of delivering software. And also we will introduce a different way to do it using uh, the choreography pattern. Finally, the cartographer open source project, which is basically an implementation of this pattern. Uh, Cora will give us a fantastic demo as usual, and we will have a wrap up and a section for questions and answers. All right, so let's start with why. So motivation for all of this comes um, from, from different places. First of all, according to the authors of this seminal book on the field of continuous delivery, the most important problem we face as software professionals is this how to take a new idea, a new application version, new commit into the hands of users as quickly as possible. That's it. This book was published like 11 years ago. So fast forward into the future, we have the definition for the term cloud native provided by Joe Vida, Kubernetes co-founder. And this definition has an implicit recognition of the same kind of problems. Cloud Native is basically a set of uh, tools, processes, culture to manage complexity and to tackle a problem of lack of velocity, lack of speed delivering software. So the core problem remains the same. So, so far, CICD pipelines have been the de facto standard to address this problem. In this pattern, we define a set of steps that code need to complete before going into production. And we have several features here. First, each one of these steps most likely is executed by a different tool, right? And if you consider the abundant number of tools uh, present in the, in the uh, cloud native space, for each one of these steps, we have a lot of options. So these individual tools need to be somehow connected between them or wired between them using this sequential pattern where, where each step is completed sequentially in a linear manner. And also in order to manage the flow of information between the steps, we rely on a central entity that, is, that follows an orchestrator pattern. It's, it's a, something like the server client pattern. And this orchestrator not only deals with um, what should be done to take code to production, I mean, the steps in the supply chain, but also how it should be done in terms of all the tooling integration, the external integrations that are necessary for this to happen. So for example, the tool that you use to watch a GitHub repo is different to the tool that you use uh, to scan source code uh, against a set of security baselines, right? So we end up with this high level of interdependencies between different tools and a very rigid logic that is right there codified in the orchestrator. That in summary, this is tight coupling, 
right? And it, this is an enemy for change in distributed systems. And tight coupling is uh, also the cause of some other problems here because it makes it difficult to swap or add tools. So for example, let's say that for a different workload, you, you want to have a different tool that actually builds your image. If you want to change a tool for one of the steps, you will need to change the logic that you already created or there in the orchestrator. So it's not easy. It's very fragile and hard to maintain. And in general, this rigid workflow also means that, for example, what if not all the changes to your app come from a commit in a GitHub repo? In this example, we are, the first step is watch a repo for a new commit. But what if, for example, in the scan source code, there's a new vulnerability discovered? In order to update or trigger the pipeline, you will have to submit an artificial commit uh, for it to run. So it's a very rigid workflow, very linear. And if uh, some step fails, the remaining steps won't be invoked at all. And also any delay in the execution of one step or any delay in the response time from the orchestration will delay the whole uh, process. So the challenge becomes even harder when you start scaling. So when you, th this is the supply chain or the pipeline definition for a specific app that runs, for example, in a Rails framework, and it's maintained by developer team number one. But what if you have another team with a completely different workload? And for example, they plan to use a different tool to build the image. You will have to codify that different logic in the orchestrator. And so on, so for you have different teams, for example, this team, they have a completely different pipeline design that doesn't start by watching a repo. They want to start at different point. It's a different logic that you will also have to codify there in the orchestrator. So at scale, we find even deeper problems. For example, this could be, or this could mean an inconsistent path to production. If we see here, each one of these pipelines uh, with different tools. These tools have different inputs, different outputs. And once you finally have pipeline number one working, it doesn't necessarily is useful for dev team number two or dev team number three for different workloads. So you will end up having a CICD pipeline sprawl for as many teams and as many workloads that you may have, you will have completely different paths to production, that's first thing. Second thing is that there is no clear separation of concerns between operations and development teams. What happens in this universe of configuration? What happens if something fails? Well, most likely developers will end up doing DevOps stuff instead of actually writing code. And it creates a high operational burden in general because it's hard to maintain. What happens, for example, again, if the organization now wants to standardize in a different tool for the uh, security scan? You will need to change the logic for all the pipelines in the environment. It, it becomes a nightmare, right? So these are the challenges so far. And what we are proposing here is the adoption of a pattern that is natural to event-driven architectures called choreography. In choreography, different to orchestration, imagine an orchestra with, where each musician, they know how to play the actual musical piece, but they still rely on a central conductor that manage the flow of information for the, for the whole musical work to happen. In choreography is different because once they are in the scenario and the music starts to play, each dancer knows what to do. Even if uh, someone else in the dance team fails, the remaining members of the team, they know what to do. So we consider here the term resource as a step, as a component in your supply chain. We call it resource because it could be several things. It could be a GitOps agent watching a repo. It could be a service building your image. It could be a config map in your Kubernetes cluster whatever you need to take code to production. We call it a resource. 
And we know two things about this resource. First, it has a single input. Input type yellow, and it, it will produce a single output. Output type yellow, output value x. That's it. It's a black box. We don't know how it works and we don't care. At this point, we don't care. So if we use a different input value, well, it will produce a different output. Pretty simple. So we can use the choreography pattern for two things here in the context of supply chains. First, um, we can use it for self-mutating resources. So imagine this resource is a GitOps agent watching a, a repo. So the input will be the URL for the repo and the branch, and that's it. So imagine that the URL has not changed, the branch has not changed, but there is a new commit. This new commit will be auto-detected by, by the controller and it will produce a new output even when inputs have not changed. In the same case as, for example, if you're using KPAC or some other service to build your image. If the container definition has not changed, but there is a new revision to the base OS image layer, um, well, it's not a new input, but it will produce a new output and automatically it will update the downstream resources accordingly. That will eliminate the need for developers to codify that kind of logic or submit an artificial commits to trigger a pipeline. It will happen automatically here. So now that we are using the image build example, what happens if for a different workload, you want to use a different tool? I mean, instead of KPAC, for example, Kanecrum. Well, as long as this new tool produces the same type of output, which is very likely, it will produce a path to your image. If you're using KPAC or Kanecrum, well, you can swap out or change the tools without changing anything else, without affecting the logic of the whole supply chain, without changing anything else. Very different compared to the pipeline orchestration pattern, right? So that's resource A. What happens with the next step in the supply chain? Well, the only thing this next step will do is to subscribe to a specific type of output or to watch for a type of output. Once this output is produced, he will know what to do. But we have a missing layer here. We need a, an intermediate layer here that will actually uh, translate what is desired state. Everything above this layer is desired state or it's declarative. It's declarative because we will define, these are the components of my software supply chain. These are the inputs, the outputs, and that's it. But there, we need a layer that translate or reconcile desired state into actual state in the underlying platform. Who could be that layer? Who could be that choreographer that is common to all the components here? Well, introducing cartographer, the supply chain choreographer for Kubernetes. Uh, we are in a project that recently joined the CNCF landscape like a week ago. We are fairly new here. It's an open source project initiated by VMware. And uh, it has uh, several differences here. So the first thing is that it removes completely the dependency on a central entity, right? And we have the same step, the same resources for your supply chain. But the first thing that it does is to wrap them around a a common abstraction. This abstraction is called template in the cartographer jargon, but conceptually it means that now we remove all these in inputs and outputs of each one of the elements in the supply chain that produce this complexity that is hard to maintain. We now have a common abstraction, pretty simple to deal with. Science has already demonstrated that the only thing you can do with complexity is to hide it, to put an abstraction layer on top of it. You cannot remove it. Right? So the, you know, what we are doing here in the project is to just that, you know, to put an abstraction layer, common abstraction layer for all these steps in the supply chain. Then we glue them together or wire them together using the choreography pattern that we just saw. And then we wrap the whole thing in a bigger abstraction or, or higher abstraction called 
blueprint. In this case, a cluster supply chain blueprint. It's pretty simple. I mean, the project only implements two types of blueprints and that's it. What's the implication? What's the meaning of this? Well, in terms of themes, we have here the cluster supply chain abstraction. We have uh, the underlying platform, the um, and we have the photographer controller or choreographer in the middle. So DevOps and SecOps in general operations team, they will own and apply the cluster supply chain definition. They, they control two things. First, uh, they define the steps for the supply chains, the, the, supply, the, the steps that code need to complete before going to production. And then they also define the level of flexibility they will enable for developers. So for example, operations teams can say, uh, developers team, you can choose whatever tool you want for building your image. I don't care, but you cannot change the tool we use uh, to scan source code in, in terms of security. I mean, that's the standard. You cannot change that, but you can change other steps. And this is completely under the control of the operations teams. From the developer point of view, the only thing they deal with is the workload definition. It's a single YAML and where they, they, where they define the needs for their workload, they will submit that using kube control to the cartographer controller. The controller will find a supply chain definition that matches the workload definition and it will translate that into resources that need to be created or updated in the underlying platform. That's it. That's the whole idea. So benefits here, I hope they're clear. First, there's a clear separation of concerns. I mean, team members, they will spend their time and efforts in their respective areas of expertise. They know uh, what to do with, with the respective um, field. And also implies a lot of flexibility because remember we have here um, a system that, that reacts to even to low level changes. So for example, there's no new commit, right? But there's a new vulnerability discovered by the scan source code process. Remember it will produce a new output and it will update the downstream resources accordingly. So you, you have now the ability to build supply chains that are much more flexible than just a sequential linear step-by-step uh, -step process. Also, it ha it's, it's much more modular because as we saw, we have these very granular controls and um, you can also, with a, as long as the output type is the same, you can interchange, you can swap out tools and add tools for different workloads very simple without affecting the consistency of the whole supply chain definition. So that helps with a scaling up, scaling out the, um, the, the problem of delivering software. It's also consistent in terms that not only the consistent interfaces between step, but in general, what the operations teams define and apply the cluster supply chain definition will, it, it can be Mm, reuse for different workloads for different environments and it will produce the same type of outputs it will it will give them peace of mind that source code is completing the necessary step before going to production right so now for the specifics how it works so we have here the steps again the the steps or the resources watching themselves for a specific output as we mentioned, the first um, abstraction is called the template. And we have five kinds of templates here in the project for different components or steps in the supply chain. And with different combinations of the templates, we produce what is called a blueprint. This is the higher abstraction in cartographer, be it cluster supply chain blueprint or being cluster de delivery. This blueprint constantly deploys and validate the configuration to the Kubernetes environment. What if you already have an investment on CICD tooling? What can we do here? Well, cartographer ships with a runnable called, uh, with a CRD called runnable that is used as a gateway, let's say, 
to integrate with existing task runners like Tekton, Jenkins, Circle CI, etc. You can still use them for the specific steps that you require. Right. All right. So in the, yeah, yeah, the theory of operation in summary will be that once a developer submits a workload that matches specific blueprint, cartographer will reconcile that into the actual resources in the underlying platform. That's the summary here. Uh, make sure that if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. We will we'll be really glad to read you there. Um, and without further ado, I will pass it to my colleague Cora for a nice demo. Okay, thanks, David. That was great. Sharing. Cool. All right, so uh, let me share my screen. And in, okay, I'm going to move this screen over here. So uh, my demo was working perfectly. Uh, and then I started to detect some problems. So if the demo does not work, then I will switch. I have, uh, I do have like a recorded it at some point. So uh, I have a little bit of a backup plan. So bear with me, hopefully. Everybody cross your fingers. Uh, we'll bring it through it somehow. Uh, but basically the plan for the demo is to show you some uh, introductory concepts. So just to reinforce the things that David was saying, um, show you how everything is wired together and then uh, go through an example of uh, the a GitOps workflow, because there's different kinds of workflows that you could um, compose with Cartographer. So I'm going to try to show you one from code to publishing your image into a registry and publishing your configuration YAML into a Git repository, and then taking that and having a second uh, blueprint or workflow that will uh, deploy that to a cluster. Uh, so let's get started. Let's see how far we get with a live demo. Uh, so, okay, so the basic workflow that we're talking about is source code, publish an image, and then end up with a running application. Um, and for that, the implementation that we're going to use is we're going to use Flux to pull the Git repository. We're going to use KPAC to build and publish the image, and then we'll deploy the application using Knative. Um, so one, one thing to gather from here is that Cartographer is not trying to do all of the things, right? It's not trying to replace these tools from the ecosystem that do their job very well. Rather, it's just trying to help us use all of these tools together, integrate them in a way that, uh, that makes sense and that's easy to work with. So first of all, just to reinforce the, the concepts, I wanted to talk about what would it mean for you if you were doing this uh, manually? Let me make this just a little bit smaller so you can spread on the screen. If you were doing this uh, manually, so you'd have to write you know, at least one YAML for each of these things, right? one Flux YAML, one KPAC YAML, one Knative Service YAML. So that would look like, uh, could look like something like this, right? So this could be, uh, so there's no cartographer here, right? This is just a Flux definition of an object called Git repository. And what we're asking Flux to do is every minute to go to our source code repository, main branch, and just check if there is a new commit. That's all that Flux is going to do. It's not going to talk to any other product in your cluster. And then we know that ideally we would like to be able to, uh, whenever Git repository finds a new commit, to take that code, somehow inject it into the definition of our KPAC image, and then have KPAC uh, build uh, an image using this builder that we are providing as part of the KPAC configuration, and then publish that to our registry. So whenever KPAC is done with that, then we would like to know that there is a new image available and we would like to know what the full tag of it is with the precise SHA so that we can inject that value into our Knative definition. So here's just plain Knative uh, so that then we can apply this to our, our cluster and effectively have our application running in our cluster. So all of those things that I've called out that have to be done manually are opportunities for automation, of course, right? This. So, um, so let's talk about, okay, so let's go ahead and apply that, uh, get, that's the um, Git repository. So we have Flux doing its thing, right? So now, uh, so that's one thing, right? Applying that YAML in and of itself, that submission of that uh, configuration to the cluster, that's one thing to automate. The second one is to just monitor the status, 
So we can see here that the status of this Git repository object has a couple of things. It has some conditions. So we know programmatically we could tell because the type is ready and the status is true. Uh, we could tell that this one is ready. And then if we look at here, this URL field has actually the tar GZ, Flux has actually gone and downloaded this and storing it in the cluster of that last commit of code. So if we could just pull out this value, we could give it to KPAC, right? And the way we pull it out is dot status dot artifact uh, dot URL. So uh, if we wanted to pull that value out, we could do something like this. For example, I'm just going to copy it to the clipboard. Uh, so then we would want cartographer to actually go to our KPAC YAML and actually do this edit for us. And paste that. And then we would want to apply this YAML to the cluster and have KPAC build an image for us. Uh, so at this point, this is where I'm not sure that my cluster is actually working out for me. Uh, the build does take a couple of minutes. So I, my expectation is that immediately it's not, uh, it's not ready yet. So this is okay. Uh, if you, uh, if you know a little bit about KPAC, so either, either we could just kind of like wait a couple of minutes and keep checking until the build is ready. But KPAC has this handy CLI called KP that allows us to check the logs of an ongoing build. So hopefully, okay, so maybe it will work. Uh, we just got to give it a little bit of a minute. So, uh, so the way, so just if you're curious, the way KPAC works is that it uses a combination of build packs to build an image. So it's, it's kind of analyzed our code. It's decided that it has to use four different build packs to build an image for us. It's going to execute each one of those build packs. Uh, in order, and we'll just give it a second to finish. By the time it's done, KPAC will have published an image to uh, to the registry. So I guess while that's happening, I'm going to check the chat and see if there are any questions. I don't see any questions, but I do see we have people joining us from uh, Bangalore and maybe other locations in India. David, you're in Colombia. We have somebody in Argentina, AJ in the Bay Area, Jonas from Boston, welcome. Very cool. Well, the build is moving along. This is the slowest part of the demo. Hopefully the rest will go well. This is a good I'm less worried now. But let, let me know if you have any questions about cartographer, we can type them in. Is it optimized build execute your that would be a KPAC question because cartographer cartographer isn't gonna in um is not gonna step into like so so if KPAC is KPAC is slow on my machine. This is because I'm doing this lo demo locally. So if you wanted to optimize this build time, there are definitely things you can do uh for KPAC to make the build go faster that I obviously have not done. But um, so cartographer doesn't know anything about KPAC. That's part of the beauty of choreography. And one of the differences between um, uh, orchestration and choreography that as a choreographer, cartographer is really just a layer above all of these things. So uh, so you can optimize the build for sure, uh, but you would be doing it with uh, KPAC. So we're almost done here. It's exporting the image. So it's publishing it to GCR. You can see already that it's got the full tag with the shot that we're going to want. Okay. All right. Moving on. Cool. We have an image on the registry. So um, the, okay. So now what we want to do is again, cartographer, we would want cartographer to have been monitoring that and to realize again, that the status type is ready and, uh, and it's true. And so now the piece of information we want to pull out of here is this latest image field, right? It's here's the tag, and this is what we want to give. So it would be dot status dot latest image. In the case of KPAC, right? If you were using another build tool, then maybe it would be a different. It would be a, probably be a different field, right? So uh, so specifically, so I've just gotten that same value, and I'm just storing it in an environment variable. So I can just inline do the environment substitution, and I'm going to take that same Knative YAML that we were looking at before. And here it is. So now 
I have this YAML. So my, I have choices now. I could either just do a, sort of the equivalent of a kubectl apply, have Cartographer just submit this YAML to the API server, and then I would have my application running uh, on, in the same cluster where I've just done this build. Or I could do a git push of this uh, to um, uh, some ops repo so that I could then deliver this application to maybe multiple clusters in multiple regions, et cetera. So both of those use cases are valid. Uh, and hopefully, as long as my demo keeps working and we have enough time, I'm going to show you Cartographer doing the git push and then the delivery. Um, but just to continue on these core concepts, um, the next thing is, so we've seen the manual approach and we've observed the opportunities for automation. So how does Cartographer uh, actually do this? So when you install Cartographer, it installs a few additional resources. So I'm going to grepping specifically for those, for the ones called templates that David was mentioning earlier. You can see there's several different types of templates that Cartographer is giving us to work with. And what we want to do is embed our, our resources, those three that we created into three of these, we have to choose the right ones. And basically you choose them based on the kind of output that the templates provide. So you can imagine that a cluster source template is probably good for our FluxDB Git repository source. A cluster image template is probably a good choice for the KPAC one. And then Knative, we're just deploying it. We don't need any output from it. So cluster template makes sense. So let's look at what that looks like. I'm just gonna focus on just the uh, Git repository and the KPAC because they have more fields in them. So the way that you embed it is um, I to literally this stuff, everything underneath template here is just copy paste the exact same thing that we just submitted to the, that we were just using and that we just looked at. This template is kind of like a free form field. You can put anything. So cartographer itself doesn't know how to work with flux. It's just like you give me some YAML and I'll apply it to the cluster. So after so, so by that, we're giving cartographer control to create the resource. And then uh, because Cartographer has created the resource, of course, it has now knowledge about it. So it can continue to check the status to see when the uh, when it's ready, when the conditions show that it has done something. And then at that point, uh, because this is a cluster source template, the cluster source template has two fields of output. One is URL and the other one is a revision. And so what we have to do is explain to Cartographer how to pull the information that we need outside of from the Flux resource. And so we've just seen that Flux puts the URL that we want in this field called status artifact URL. So this is how we uh, bridge that gap and teach Cartographer how to read the, the desired information from whatever uh, resource is underneath the template. Same for uh, KPAC image, because this is an image type of template the output is going to be an image, and we're telling it where to get the value is going to be the image path is status latest image. But other than that, underneath this template field, we basically just copied and pasted the very same thing we just looked at. Uh, the only thing that's different here is just the syntax. So you can tell that Cartographer is going to have to inject the source URL. Um, so the syntax is, uh, is not environment variables. It's, it's this kind of syntax. So that's how you uh, kind of start to wire it together. But what we haven't told Cartographer yet is that it should apply the Git repository YAML before it applies the KPAC, right? It does, Cartographer doesn't know what order to do things in. And also, we could have maybe several Git repositories that we are monitoring. So we have to tell Cartographer exactly which of those Git repositories uh, it should use to inject the value into KPAC. So we do that using a supply chain. So uh, supply chain is... Um, yeah, I'm just going to make it tiny, a bit smaller. I hope you can still read this. Okay, so here's our supply chain. Uh, so it's another cartographer resource. And um, you can see that it has a list of resources, right? David was talking about resources. So we have three resources, our Git repository, our KPAC image, and our Knative application. And so the way that these work is every resource has a name and a reference to a template. And so these references are exactly the, the templates we were just looking at. They, it's cluster source, cluster image, and cluster template. Uh, and this is just the name of the, of the actual resource that we're pointing to, um, the, the metadata.name inside of our cluster source template. So, so now there's an order. Now Cartographer knows Git is first, KPAC is second. And when it does KPAC, we're also creating a dependency now for injection 
where we're saying we need this template need needs input and that input is going to come from a cluster source template so it's a, a list of sources and which one is it it's the one called source provider so this is matches this and same here you're saying we're saying here that we have an image type input coming from a resource called image builder here is image builder and in effect it is an image type template um, and so that's basically it you can have many many inputs so that's why they have names here so that you can refer to them separately if you have multiples and then it would be sources dot source dot url for example or images dot image and then the field is also called image uh, so that that explains this syntax i showed you so sources dot source dot url that's where that's coming from from the supply chain so uh so now we've got a lot working for us but uh this is this supply chain that i showed you is going to work really really well for my hello world application because i've hard-coded that name in there and i've hard-coded that url so really what we want to do is parameterize that information and we do that through something called a workload and so you could also imagine that so far everything that we've seen the templates in the supply chain is something that an application's operator would do it could build out multiple supply chains which, with multiple paths to production and then this view is what the developer would see, would, what would use, right? Um, the developer would be responsible for providing the URL and the branch, you know, most basically, that would be the basic information. If the application operator exposed more fields for the developer to use, then, you know, it's possible that a developer could fill in more fields, but the sort of the basics are these. Um, and then because you could have multiple supply chains running in the cluster, we put a label on the workload here, and this one is called uh, AppTownsUsVMware.com workload type web. And that label is needs to match the selector. So if I scroll back up to the cluster supply chain, this has a selector with the same value. So as soon as that workload is, is deployed, this supply chain will respond. It'll say, oh, I, have, I see that workload. I have to act on it. And so it will take those values and uh, and inject them. So the last, very last thing we need to do is go review all of our templates and parameterize all those values that were hard coded. So the way that would look would be if I scroll up here. So for our, for our cluster source template, instead of hard coding the name, when it's, when, when it's going to stamp out that Git repository resource for our particular application, instead of hard coding hello world, now we're going to take that value from the workload. And instead of hard coding the URL and the branch, again, we're taking those values from the workload. So now this can be used for many applications. And you can see here on the image one, same thing, the work, the, the name will match. Uh, we're gonna use the same name to, to name the image, but we also have uh, other sources. We can uh, define more global parameters that are shared across workloads. So for example, the name of the registry, that might be something we wanna make more general. Um, and then you can better understand also here the syntax of this is the injection that cartographer will do automatically from the source, right? It has all these different sources of information. So that's kind of how it all uh, wires together. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna keep going with this example. So I'm gonna move to to the Git ops example, and I'll just I guess keep going until for as long as I have time. So hopefully I can get through the whole thing. But um, I do want to show you that these examples are coming from here. Uh, I'm going to run actually this. The, there's a set of examples in the cartographer repo, which are really great. And what I'm going to try to get through is these last two. This is sort of the Git ops uh, using the supply chain to go from code to Git repo and then the delivery to go from Git repo, the ops repo to the deployment. But I would encourage you if you're if, if you're if you want to try it on your own, you can get it from here, or you can try the other examples here as well. They're all great. So, okay, so let's try the Git writer example. So we're going to do a little bit of a different flow. Uh, we're going to go still source using Flux and to build the image using KPAC. We might have a time for a little more chat while KPAC is doing its work. And then we're going to actually use a cluster uh, config template to write the configuration to a config map and then use Tekton uh, to do a git push. It'll read from the config map and it'll git push to a git repository. 
So that'll be our the the left side, I guess, of of uh, GitOps. So I'm just going to go ahead and deploy. So the example files that I showed you that are part of that uh, that are part of the cartographer repository. I just deployed everything at once, the, the supply chain as well as the workload. So uh, while that's running in the background, so hopefully KPAC will uh, will finish before we're done talking about this. So this this supply chain is a little bit different from the first one we looked at, right? Uh, this is the same. I left the, the selector the same. Instead of having two supply chains, we're just overriding the last one, which is okay. Um, and uh, so we don't have to change the workload, basically. That's what that means. And the resources, again, the first two resources are exactly the same. So you can also kind of see that these supply chains, because they're decoupled from the templates, they allow you to reuse templates in, in different order if you want or in different, just in different kinds of uh, designs. So we're reusing our first two, the cluster source template and the cluster image template that we had before. And in, uh, at the end, instead of just deploying it, we're going to use a cluster config template to uh, uh, write the value, write the um, Knative definition to a map, to a config map. And then we're going to use a cluster template that is going to call Tecton, uh, is going to utilize Tecton, Tecton to do the git push. So I'm going to show you the cluster config template, the one that the third new resource here. OK, so this basically, let's scroll to the top. Um, OK, so here it is. And so it's another one of our cartographer templates, cluster config template. And in this case, uh, the output of this is going to be some config information. So we have to tell it where to find this config information. And we're saying this one's not in the status, uh, but this one is in a field called dot data dot manifest. How do we know that? It's because we're defining in our config map definition that the values are going to be in dot data dot manifest. So that's it's going to go to the config map and get whatever is there. And then as far as like what we're actually writing to that field, uh, it's a bunch of YAML, but it includes um, it includes that same Knative. This is, it's a little bit differently um, uh, coded, I guess, here. But it is ultimately that same Knative service definition. And, uh, and we also want to be able to interpolate values dynamically. So we're just using, rather than the dollar sign syntax, it uses a syntax. YTT is a tool from Carvel. Uh, very powerful for templating and overlaying YAML. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is going to generate that same uh, YAML. So if you kind of peek out, here is the Knative service. And uh, it's going to um, inject, again, this is just a different way of saying the same thing, data values images. This is just a way to call out the image that we want to dynamically inject in a way that YTT can understand. So. Um, it's just a lot of YAML for the screen. Uh, so the templates for the Tecton portion of it to push to Git, uh, that's also a lot of YAML for the screen. So I'm not actually going to show you. I'm just going to show you that there's three files here. Uh, and uh, I think I think soon with Cartographer, you might we might be able to like consolidate this a little bit. But uh, we're basically using a, a task that's available on the Tecton catalog for Git CLI and uh, and hooking that into Cartographer. But same, same concepts that you've seen so far, more or less, to do that. So from a developer perspective, since we didn't change the selector on the supply chain, nothing really changes for the developer. So, um, so remember, when I switched directories, I already applied this. So let's see if, if it's done. Hopefully it will have finished already. Okay, good. Okay, so in the meantime, uh, our our workload finished running. So let's see. We can use there's this uh, handy plugin called Tree. Uh, let's to see like what what our resource kind of like spawned. What are what's the tree of things that that got generated? So sorry, this is a little loud. Okay, there we go. So we, as developers, uh, applied a workload, right? And that generated first a Git repository resource. When that was done, it created an image. The image did its thing and built, built an image. And then after that was ready, it generated the supply chain, created the config map with our values. And then, uh, and then, it, and then after the config map was ready, it called Tecton. So what we should have, 
and these, these are red, but they're just because they're jobs, they're, they didn't fail. What we expect to have right now is that in our Git repository, we should have the, the YAML that we would want to deploy to any cluster. So I'm just gonna do here a Git clone. I have a Git repo running on the cluster, but it's just, I'm just doing a Git clone. And let's look at what we got in that Git clone. And we, so we do have config manifest.yaml, so that's good, that's what we expect. And if we look inside the file, uh, there we go, there's YAML, here's the Knative portion. So it's done YTT without all that YDT kind of like I stuff. Uh, it's interpolated all of the right values, so our application name and the image. And so now this is ready to be deployed to any cluster you want, right? So that part of our demo, that part of the demo finished, right? The, we've, we've done our job for the left side of GitOps. So now if we move over to the right hand side, uh, we have something called a delivery. So just as we've been looking at supply chains, there's a counterpart, we call these blueprints that does the delivery of that YAML uh, to whatever cluster you, you want. And so it's gonna be responding. We're gonna use, again, very similar. We're gonna use Flux to detect new commits on that ops repo and then deploy it to Kubernetes. So if we look at the delivery, very similar structure to the supply chain, uh, cluster delivery instead of cluster supply chain, we still have the selector so that it can uh, detect uh, when there will be deliverables instead of workloads, there are deliverables. And again, similar structure, two resources. The first one is very similar. It still it uses a Git, Git repository from Flux again, because all we're doing is pulling a Git re, re, uh, repo. But then for the deploy, we use another kind of template called a cluster deployment template, uh, where we're going to take you know the output from that this one finds in Git and deploy that. So I think uh, yeah, we can take okay. Let's take a look at that YAML quickly. But it's it's sort of the same idea, right? Cluster deployment template. Uh, there's no output here either, so we just have this uh, this template to 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 grab whatever URL was there, uh, extract that. And, um, and and we're just telling it uh, how 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 do you know how can cartographer know that this was successful because not everything uses the same syntax like the ones that we saw earlier were ready is true but sometimes there's some resources that are, that are built differently so this one is reconcile succeeded reconcile failed so just another way that you can teach cartographer to work with the resources that you're you're asking it to uh, deploy so uh, the deliverable again the counterpart to the workload so this would be the thing that represents that precise repo that uh, that we are working with for this hello CNCF app, right? So this is our that's our that's our repo for this for this particular app. So if we apply all of this, then we would expect cartographer to very quickly go um, go to that repo, realize that there's a commit ready for us, grab it and deploy it so we can see and that's what it did so that deliverable led uh cartographer to create the git repository the git repository very quickly realized there's something to apply and then it created the, the deployer template was applied and, and it created this so just to uh make sure that it is actually running let's make sure that our knative deployment is there which it is so we can really quickly do a port forward and we can send a request to our application and it is running and okay the demo did work i was panicking for no reason okay that's um that's it let me stop sharing my screen awesome thank you cora yeah demo gods are with us today yeah <laughs> Thankfully. all right yeah so um yeah, keep the the questions coming. We're we're doing our best to try to address them, and wow. just let us know if if that's not the case, and we hope to continue continue the conversation after the session. So wrapping up, the current challenges we see with the uh, pipeline orchestration pattern is that is tightly coupled, very high level of interdependencies between steps. Uh, and once you start scaling, it becomes harder to maintain, to adapt to different workloads, and also to, you know, modify tools or add tools. As we saw, it's, it implies a lack of consistent paths to production because these uh, highly customized uh, do-it-yourself pipelines along your 
whole environment. And also there's no clear separation of concerns. Uh, the benefits uh, we see in the using supply chain choreography will be that, well, first, because of the choreography pattern, there is this loosely coupled, loosely, loose coupling between steps or between resources. It's highly customizable in turn, as, as we just saw, and, you know, each one of the examples or each one of supply chains that Cora demonstrated was completely different and it uses use it different tools for different uh, purposes and even you know providing an the enough level of flexibility to developers it maintains consistency and it's repeatable for different environments and workloads and it also provides a model with clear separation of concerns both for operations and dev teams and finally giving us the flexibility to produce or design different uh, configurations to get source code to production. And in general, is much more reliable. It doesn't have the dependency on a central entity uh, to manage all the steps, much more trustable. All right, we hope uh, this was educational for you. We would really like to keep the conversation going, bring your questions, your easy your tough questions to our several communication channels i will uh let me i will put here link to our slack channel in the kubernetes workspace you are welcome to join continue conversation and even join us in the meetings if you want is there any question outstanding question right there that we could address in the a few minutes that we have remaining. I think we do have a few. Cora, can you see them or do we want to turn yeah, the I'm just trying to catch up and see. Yeah, which ones are outstanding? Which ones have not been answered? Just trying to catch up on that. Uh, yeah, the one from Anand uh, is basically optimizing sequential and parallel steps by analyzing steps. Oh. So I think, Anand, if you're talking about uh, so if you're talking about cartographer, then I think David is answering right that that cartographer. Uh, you, it's I'm not sure how much is on the roadmap and how much is now. I guess David, you're probably you're probably more up to date on on parallel uh, than cartographer. But, but if you're talking about KPAC, um, then KPAC does definitely have uh, optimizations built into it, uh, and it does a lot of like caching. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't apply the build packs in parallel, uh, but there's there it, it has two different kinds of caching and it does a lot of analysis. So that build that you were watching was the first time build, um, and so uh, this any further builds would be faster. Um, and then any other kind of parallelization kind of depends on the. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered. Yeah, right now what cartographer can provide here is uh, again a way to design the, the execution path, even considering parallel uh, tasks. Not much in the analysis uh, field. I mean, cartographer itself tries to not deal with the specifics of each step, um, and specifically not much with analyzing. Um, but in, in the whole context of uh, providing flexibility for different supply chain designs, Cartographer could help with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, is Ben say yeah. is that an answer to the question? You can see the example at the bottom. Uh, I mean, definitely, for, there's a lot of use cases if you don't have, if you're in cluster, and if there's not a tool that does exactly what you want, um, like um, uh, like Flux or like k like, like for example, the Git push use case, right? We had to use Tecton for that. Tecton is is a tool that allows you that will execute for you in a container a script of your of your authoring, right? So Cartographer doesn't do that. Cartographer, you can't give Cartographer a script for it to run inside a container. Cartographer can orchestrate things, but, um, but if you need some kind of like, uh, like arbitrary activity to happen, you could reach out to something like a Tecton and Tecton will run any script for you. So um, 
I think that probably covers a few of these sort of uh, cases where uh, the task that you're trying to accomplish doesn't exist as uh, as a tool itself in in um, in, in Kubernetes. Um, there's a really there's an example I think uh, Scott Rosenberg actually uh, he has his GitHub repository I think V Rabbi or V Rabbi IL. He, I don't know if you know what that URL, David. Yeah. He wrote an example of like provisioning VMs. I think it was right. He stamped yeah. out a whole set of virtual machines using Cartographer. So, because it's just this orchestration layer that can orchestrate uh, any 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 sequence of tools, and those and those tools can essentially accomplish anything. Because if there isn't a tool that does exactly what you want, it doesn't say you can use a tool that can run any script that you want that can make callouts. Uh, you know that can check things that are outside the cluster, trigger things, check check responses. Uh, I don't know that there's really any limitation to what you could put together. So I wonder if we could share that. Uh, if we can get it quickly enough. Let me see. Um, right. Yeah. I just share the link to the repo. Cool. Um, he is a cryptographer use user, and this is just an example of how far can the project get outside Kubernetes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's using, right, he use, goes from a Git source and he provisions virtual machines. So he's stamping out, so to that Terraform kind of question, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That repo would be a great example of how to stamp out a bunch of virtual machines. And so that uh, that's the approach that uh, Scott took, um, but you can use it as a model if you want to take a slightly different approach. So yeah, I hope that that answers the question. Um, let's see, I'm going to see if there's other others. Um, yeah, I don't think I see different ones. And we are at time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both so much, David and Cora. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Definitely click their links to join in the conversation post event. And we will have all of this up and online later this afternoon for anyone who missed it. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.